Welcome to another episode of Due North, where we're navigating life and theology with the compass of God's Word. I'm Charlie Matz. I'm here with Pastor Ben Blakey, and we're talking today about how Christians should approach politics. An important discussion always, but yep. especially in light of the year that we're finding ourselves in with an upcoming election. And as we start this discussion, I heard that you once had an interest in politics. It's true. I once wanted to be the president of the United States. If you were to come to like high school me, I would have said, I'm running in 2032. So plan ahead to vote for Blakey. 2032. I mean, that we still got time. I, I think I have a better job. No. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think a more important job, but still politics are important. And as a matter of fact, I actually saw a picture. Maybe we can throw that up for those watching this on the video. A very presidential picture of you recently. So maybe there still is hope, but hopefully there's somebody out there as knowledgeable and as wise as Ben Blakey that could run in 2032. But that being said, we're talking about how Christians should approach politics. What do you what do you think about? That? Well, first, I just want to be very clear. We're going to answer every possible question that could come up about politics today. We're, we're just going to make sure that there's there's there, there's nothing that's unclear at all anymore. Great. Just kidding. Um, politics, obviously, is a, a wide ranging topic. Also, to be fair, especially if we think about Christians in politics, there's some things that are actually pretty complex about it, too. Right. So we're not going to answer every question, get into every hypothetical. But kind of what I want to do is just give three broad principles that I think if every Christian kind of internalized and embraced these things, that would be a good starting place. Okay. So we're not going to end all conversations, but hopefully we can get to a good a starting place today with just three basic principles. That sounds good. Well, where should we start? Well, I think we should start with the Bible. Hey. Uh, and, and we should, uh, if I could word it for, I guess this is like a three-point sermon. <laughs> Number one, obey what the Bible clearly says. Um, there are, I think, in politics a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of area where we're, we're trying to apply biblical principles and it can be legitimately complicated, but there's some things that are very straightforward mm -hmm. and, and very simple. And what I like to say is if we're not doing the clear parts well, there is no way in the world we'll do the unclear parts well. Right. Um, so we have to start with what the Bible says. And there's, there's four passages that just spring to the top of my mind. Uh, when this conversation comes up. And the first is Romans 13. Uh, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, for those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God according to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes is owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. So there you see that passage gives a lot of context and information, and you, you sum it up though with, with that idea of we have to submit to the government. That, that's the first thing. It says be in subjection. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the first thing. The pattern of our lives should be obedience to the governing authorities. And the text makes it very clear that obedience to the governing authorities is obedience to God. Right. right. That's where our ultimate allegiance is. And God is the one commanding us to obey the authorities that he has. That's what the text says. He has put in place. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of times what Christians want to do is we want to jump to the exceptions, of which I think there are exceptions right. to this. But I think sometimes we just want to go straight to those objections without, you know, settling in on right. what the command is first. Right. Well, I, I've said it before, and I've heard others say it like this. It oftentimes feels like our default mode is civil disobedience. Mm-hmm. We're almost looking for a reason to obey. L prove to me why I should obey. Right, right. When our default mode, biblically, should be civil obedience. Right. 
And that really changes the mindset. That really follows the pattern we see in Scripture. Right. Any break from this should very much be the exception. And I think multiple of these texts that we'll look at, one that's very similar, I probably won't turn there, is 1 Peter 2, is very similar to this. And if you look at most commentaries or you open up your study Bible, they'll tell you these were most likely written when Nero was the emperor of the Roman Empire. So here is a, a, a leader that is immoral, unjust, wicked, killing Christians, and yet what the Bible is saying is submit to the governing authorities. Like, there's almost a shock factor of that that yeah. I think we want to just avoid um, and, and run away from when, no, we, we should listen to that. And you'll you'll hear other theories that basically say, well, this only applies if the government is doing its job and staying in its lane. Right. And that's where I think th- there are some complex things that come in there, but I think we want to start with the Bible says what it says. I was corresponding recently with one of my professors from college who taught on political studies, and he was in a debate, and they were talking about Romans 13, and the other person accused him of, oh, so you think Romans 13 means what it says. (laughs) And I said, well, anytime you can be accused of that, I think you're in a good spot, right? And I think that's, that's an important place for us to start. And so when we come to what are the exceptions, I mean, some people, again, they want to get more complicated. I still am not convinced of anything other than this is what we do unless the government is telling us to do something that would be wrong and a sin against God, or the government is telling us to stop doing something that God has clearly told us to do, right? Right. And the, some of the biggest biblical examples, I mean, the book of Daniel has one each way. Yep. Daniel is told, stop praying. No, I'm not going to stop praying. His friends are told, bow down. No, I'm not going to bow down. And Mm -hmm. I'll take, and even there's a submissive way that they go about that, that they're not trying to overthrow the government. Right. It's no, we're not going to obey and we'll take the consequences, right? Throw us into the furnace, throw us to the lions. We're going to obey God rather than men. And that line is said by the apostle Peter when they command him to stop preaching the gospel. He says, no, we have to obey God rather than men. And that's where we, we do think, you know, somewhat in America, there are ways there are laws that you might say that's that law isn't right. And that's where I would say, well, there are legal avenues to go through to challenge whether a law is constitutional or not. We, we don't just, well, I'm going to revolt and overthrow the government. No, I, I'm going to challenge that based on the law. So even your protest of the law is based on the law. So it, it is, yeah. you're still submitting to the governing authorities. And I as think you what you that. said was really good. Even our obedience, even our disobedience should be done in a Christ like way. Right. There's never sin involved. It's always right. obedience to God in every category. Right. And even recently I pointed out in a sermon that I was preaching that Daniel's Babylonian given name really referred to the worship of their false God. Right. And so he's sitting there living a life that's not comfortable. That's right. actually very offensive. And the only time that he chooses to really uh, disobey is when he's asked to stop doing something that God commands. So you gave us two verses, really, out of those four that you had said you were going to mention. What are the other two? So the other two, I mean, uh, second, First Peter 2 is the other passage, very similar right. to Romans 13. The other two kind of get even somewhat into our attitude. First Timothy chapter 2 uh, gives us uh, some commands. It says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there one command it gives us is we need to pray for our leaders. Mm -hmm. And so that's just another, that's a very clear, it's a very simple command. We need to start by making sure we're doing that. If we're not praying for our leaders, we're not doing what God calls us calls us to do. And again, if we're not doing the clear things right, there's no chance we're going to do the complicated things right. right. And another thing, it throws in this interesting phrase of this goal that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And I think that we need to be careful with that. I don't think that means, hey, Christians shut up and don't ever speak up for the truth. Right. That, that, that I don't think is in mind of what the text is saying. But we're not trying to be by default argumentative revolutionaries right we're, we're trying to live a peaceful and quiet life and our goal is as it goes on to say we want to see people get saved right right that is our ultimate 
goal. And then uh, the other passage I would mention is Titus chapter 3, which starts with that call to be submissive. But then it gets into even how we interact with other people. It says in verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. So even just that last phrase, whatever political conversations you get involved in, and some of those can get, well, heated. God is commanding you, you need to show perfect courtesy towards all people. We should never be... Um, you know, just using pejorative language. We should never be nasty and, right. and mean, right? Even to speak evil of no one. Right. Even online? Even, especially, I would say, online. Yes, the comments, this applies to the comments section on posts on the internet. Um, but even I think of to speak evil of no one, and even if you just take our last two presidents who are now running against each other, I've never seen in my life, you know, curse words connected to a president's name as much as I have with the last two presidents. Right. And I think that's just very, that's very clear and very easy. Th- there's no place for that in the mouth of a Christian or typed by a Christian. We should never be bringing in expletives and curse words um, against, you know, one of our l- leaders. That, that's just not what God would, would call us to. Right. So that being said, a, a lot of times when people are interacting with politics, thinking about these things, they might give too much weight to politics, meaning that they think that the problems that we're seeing in the world are really due to the wrong person in office. Right. And the solution might be get the right person in office. Right. Uh, you know, wh- what does the Bible have to say about well, that? Well, that brings me to my second main principle for us, and that is we need to remember the root cause and the, the real solution to the world's problems. And that's where... I think this is something we need to come back to because there's differences in governments around the world. There's differences in culture around the world. But one thing that is universal throughout the world and throughout history is the root problem is sin. Mm -hmm. The real solution to that is the gospel. Mm -hmm. And in our time in history, the vehicle through which the gospel is going to be delivered is through the local church. So even just as you look out at the world, the real problem, the root problem is sin, rebellion against God, missing the mark of his creation. The solution is the gospel. Jesus came, he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. Mm -hmm. And what's going to bring that solution to the world is the local church. And so we always need to make sure that that's important in our minds. And this is where now we need to be very careful in how we think, because a lot of people will just, which is it? Should I be focused on the church or should I, you know, be involved in politics? Well, we don't need to create a false dichotomy there. We, we don't need to, to act like, well, you can't be involved in politics and involved in the local church. That's just not true. So let's be careful that we don't create a false dichotomy or act like those things are mutually exclusive. However, just because those things can coexist doesn't mean that they are equal okay. in importance. Right. And that's where I would say we have to remember the local church, and I've said this multiple times recently, the local church is the most important institution in the world, period, full stop. Amen. That is the, the root of, of God's plan for the world and for making disciples. It is the local church church. Now, again, that's not means that that doesn't mean the Christians can't be involved in politics, but here's, here's some things I think help understand that, right? We often are thinking about politics from a very American perspective, which makes sense. Right. We're all Americans. We live in America. We operate in the political system of America. So w- we need to think about that, but the church can thrive, can exist anywhere in any culture under any political system. That's one reason why I would say, hey, the the church is is more important because throughout time and throughout the whole world, the church is there. The church can thrive. The church will thrive. God has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He has never said anything like that about the United States of America. So we need to prioritize the church and realize that is the thing that's going to address 
um, the, the root issues. And that even, if we want to get biographical again, that's one of the reasons why I'm in full-time ministry. I was getting a pre-law degree, or political studies degree, with an emphasis in constitutional law, and I went on a missions trip to Uganda mm. that, was, that had a legal focus. We did a, a conference at a Christian university on God, law, and justice. Okay. We visited all kinds of you know, legal organizations there and, and ways that people were using the law to do good things in Uganda. So those were all good things that I wouldn't say all oh, Christians shouldn't shouldn't do that. Um, but what got me most excited on that trip was, hey, here's this guy, Shannon Hurley, that's planning a church, start, wants to build a center to train pastors. That's what got me most excited because, you know, you hear about corruption in a place like Uganda and you get there and you realize the root problem of everything that's going on here is sin. Mm -hmm. People aren't following God's plan. And the solution to that is the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need more strong local churches. Again, we don't want to make those mutually exclusive. Hey, Christians, don't start good stuff with the law to help people. No, Christians, go go and do that. But we need to make sure that the, the backbone of all that is strong local churches. Yeah. And so I think that even when people ask me about it as a pastor, that gives some focus to what we do. Uh, as a church, we're not going to avoid political issues. Right. Just for the, we, we're going to teach the Bible, and there's many times where political issues are going to to come up. Right? I remember I was preaching on Psalm two the Sunday right after the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade, right? And I mentioned that, and we addressed that because the, the Scripture was almost speaking straight to that. People applauded, and I know people that have never been back to our church since because people applauded the reversal of of Roe v. Wade, right? right. And we're going to be unashamed of that going through Genesis, we've seen things like the image of God and how, you know, that goes directly contrary to this whole transgender agenda right. in our world. There are also, if we're combating ideas of racism, right, the, the idea of the image of God goes strongly against right. that too, right? We're not going to shy away from those things. But as a church, we're never going to try to act like a political organization by doing a voter registration drive or endorsing specific candidates because there's political organizations that can do that better than we can. Right. And God's given us a job to do by making disciples. That if we, w That's the thing. If, if I'm not speaking about a political issue, guess what? Someone else can do that. And they might even do it better than I can because they're paying more attention and following. If the church isn't proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, teaching the Bible, nobody else is going to do that. Right. right? And, and so w we need to, as a church, I think, remain somewhat laser-focused on that. Again, that doesn't mean we're avoiding political issues, but we have to stay focused on that root problem and the core solution to that problem mm -hmm. in the gospel because it is a real situation where if we're not doing that, nobody else will. And a lot of the change we want to see in society will actually, I think, be downstream from more people following Christ. Right. Because I even just think I've done all pretty much all the ministry in my life have been in pretty conservative places, actually. Right. Grew up in Texas, served at a church in Orange County, which is like the one blotch of red on the coast of California, and now in Idaho. And in all those places, yeah, the politics to me are a lot preferable, and I think more based on biblical principles and wisdom than other places. But there's a lot of unsaved people in all of those places right. that share the same political values that I have, but they're not following Christ. Right. They haven't turned from their sin and put their faith in Christ. And that's where if the church isn't calling people to that, Nobody will. And right. our goal isn't to have a necessarily a conservative society, although I think that would be a good thing and a byproduct of a more Christian society. We want to see more people truly following Christ. I think that's really helpful because as pastors, a lot of times if something kicks up in the political arena, <clears throat> they might come to us and say, what are you going to do about this? W how are you going to respond to this? And I think you just gave us a great answer to that question. Right. No, that, thanks for bringing that up. I, I feel like I'm... I, I have this urge in me all the time. What are we going to do about this? I'm like, church, church is what we're going to do about this. And again, that's not the only thing that Christians can do about problems in our society. But I think some people think that doing something and church are totally disconnected. Right. And I'm just, that is such an unhealthy way to think. It is. Um, so yeah, then the third thing is, is now when we think about the public sphere and as Christians go about their lives, the third thing I would encourage Christians to do is support what is good and true as opportunity and conscience allow, right? Yeah. And that's where, especially from an American perspective, we have rights, we have opportunities, and, and I think it, it's a good thing if we use those uh, to be good stewards of those and to do to do our best 
with those. I mean, there's some things in the political realm where there's just a very clear right and wrong answer. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we th- I think of Isaiah 5 a lot in our world, right? Every time the month of June rolls around, I'm just like, woe to those who call good evil and evil good, because that's what's going on in our society. As Christians, we want to be people that call good good and evil evil, right. and we're unashamed uh, to do that. Um, but I think one thing that gets tricky just in this, hey, well, I want to support what is good and true, there can be kind of a conflation pretty quickly of what Christians, I would argue, may do mm-hmm. and what Christians must do. I mean, I think some people say, well, Christians must speak up. Okay, what does that look like? Does that mean Christians, every Christian must be vocal on social media about political issues? Or is that a, a may, right? And so that's where I think we need to be careful with what we say that looks like. And people are coming that from all different angles. There's some people that are just like, hey, I care about these things, but I'm kind of dis- disillusioned by the whole political process. So I'm not going to get too worked up about politics just because... I feel like Charlie Brown trying to kick the football again, and I've been told every four years, if we don't get this election right, you know, and I just feel used, and I think th- there may be some legitimacy for some Christians that are thinking that, but I think other Christians say, hey, if we're if we're faithful and we're good stewards and we work hard, maybe we can see some positive things happen, and I think there's some validity to that, and this is one point where I think a great thing for us to do as Christians is don't be so quick to be judgmental of others. And let's be people that model what it looks like to have a conversation where we listen and understand and share, right? I think it's easy for Christians to look at somebody, they're more politically involved than I am. Oh, they're distracted. You know, they're getting caught up in politics. Really? You know their heart? You know that they're, you don't, you know that they're not also faithfully doing a lot of other things God's called them to do? Them being more involved means that they're distracted? Slow down on that take. Or somebody looks at somebody who's less politically involved in them and says, oh, they're not standing up for what's right. Like, we need to slow down some of that rhetoric right. as Christians and you know, maybe say, hey, I've noticed you're involved in politics. Why? Well, you know, I'd love to hear your heart on that. Or, you know, hey, it seems like you're not really interested in politics. Why is that? Right. And if we listen, we might have some good conversations and actually sharpen each other. Cause maybe there's some people that, you know, there are some opportunities that I'm leaving on the table where I could speak up for what is good and right and true. And I'm not, and maybe someone else realizes, you know, there, there's some ways maybe I'm, I'm putting too much stock in this. And that's not like, I think we'd all be better off if we had those conversations. Those are some great words. I mean, anything else you'd want us to finish with as we wrap things up? Anything you want us to think about as we leave this conversation? Yeah, I do think, again, from Ameri- an American context, when we think about what supporting what is good and true, you know, th- not every issue is the same, mm-hmm. right? Th- there are some issues, like I would say abortion is one, where, hey, we're really talking about murder here. Um, and then there's, what's the best way for the city of Meridian to expand responsibly with all the people moving here? Like, See how those are two very different issues? Right. And that's where you start to get into some of the complexities. Like, there are some things that I think are somewhat simple. For instance, we operate pretty much in a two-party system. And increasingly, one of those parties, the Democratic Party, has put, for lack of a better word, because there probably isn't a better word, evil right at the center of what, what, they're, what they're all about, right? We are about abortion, which is the murder of babies. We are about this whole... LGBTQ agenda, which, you know, we're, we're about mutilating children, basically, for this perverse sexual agenda, right? Those things, even over the last several decades, have become very much more central mm-hmm. to, you know, what the Democratic Party is, is all about. Now, that, to be clear, that does not mean that the Republican Party is the party of saints and angels. Right. Um, and that's where you start to get into some com- complex situations, right? In some elections where, hey, I've got two really bad candidates, how do I decide there? Or, hey, I've got a couple of good options in this election. And that's where I think some people, they, they may feel a lot of stress. Like, hey, if I don't vote perfectly, every you know, I'm not being faithful. And I would just encourage people, do the best you can, right? I, I would encourage people, be informed, be involved as you can. Do the best that you can. Some people may have more opportunity. Some may have less. Don't turn this into a burden. But as you are able, I think it's good for Christians to to do what they can to support what is true and what is right and what is good as we seek to love our neighbors, be the salt of the earth. Uh, you know, I think th- those can be helpful things in that process. 
Uh, I think that's a good word to end on, especially with this year ramping up to elections and lots of different decisions, whether that's locally or nationally. And I hope that's helpful as you think about how we Christians should approach politics. And I hope that that's uh, useful for conversation, for prayers, to pray for our leaders, and really just to wrestle with those things in our own hearts. So thanks for joining us on this episode, and we'll look forward to uh, talking to you again on our next episode of Due North. And until then, use God's word to navigate life and theology as your compass.